So with that in hand, I'll pass it over to um, Troy and uh, we'll probably, and, and, and we'll mute everybody, okay? Okay, thanks, Troy. Uh, thanks, Lord Roger. Thanks, Sally. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to everyone else for showing up for this lunchtime chat. I know people can suffer from the Zoom overload. And yes, I'm particularly impressive that you stayed up until this hour uh, for this talk. Um, so I'll share my screen in a second uh, and I will try to keep the talk to 20, 25 minutes and then hopefully we can just have a, a general chat because I'm, I'm not really sure uh, with different audiences that I speak to about basic income where everyone is at in terms of their knowledge of basic income. So I'll include some of the more rudimentary information and then get on to uh, a specific discussion of basic income in relation to Australia. Okay, share my screen. Okay, so uh, that's my name. I'm a lecturer, um, Troy Henderson, lecturer in political economy at the University of Sydney. Uh, emails there, Twitter handle. I'll share these slides in, in the chat afterwards. Um, so anyone who wants to get in contact at any time, feel free to do so. Okay, I'd also like to start by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land of the Cadigal, Wangal and Bidiagal clans of the Darug Nation where I am today in Southway, Southwest Sydney and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Okay, first let's get to the definitions of basic income. So the basic income earth network, which is really the preeminent sort of scholarly international body that uh, deals with uh, basic income and runs an annual conference, which for your information will actually be held in Australia hopefully, fingers crossed, next year uh, at the University of Queensland with perhaps some other university partners. So Bian defines basic income as a periodic cash payment unconditionally delivered to all on an individual basis without means test or work requirement. Um, and this is a nice definition. It's a widely used definition, but it's not a universal, universally accepted definition. And there's great debate about what exactly constitutes and qualifies as a basic income. And uh, for some, a negative income tax, going back to the ideas of Milton Friedman and, and others, is also part of the basic income debate. And there are a couple of quick key questions to ask when we're thinking about definitions of basic income, what are we prioritizing? The universal aspect of it, making sure that everybody, every member of a particular community receives uh, the same payment, the same regular payment, or do we want to prioritize the basic element to make sure that it, it has a meaningful impact on someone's material standard of living? And an associated point in relation to this is, you know, do we go for the principle of universalism or do we take into account a, a more pragmatic concern with fiscal churn? So, for example, if you're uh, financing basic income using some combination of progressive taxation uh, and you're dispensing uh, the same uh, payment, say $20,000 a year to everyone, and then you're taxing that straight back off uh, a significant number of people, plus additional taxation in order to finance the basic income scheme, uh, is that a very efficient use of fiscal resources? There are, I wanna emphasize one other thing about it. basic income as you know is, is often called UBI, universal basic income. And I always say that the U also stands for something else which occasionally gets lost in the debate, which is unconditional, right? So the, the idea that this is a matter of right, not a charity. It's not a categorical payment, but something that you can rely on automatically as a member of a particular political community or social community. Uh, there are four basic models of universal basic income. So a stakeholder grant, the idea of a, a one-off lump sum payment that equalizes the distribution of wealth at a particular point in time. Uh, social dividend. So, for example, Alaska has the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend, where part of the reinvested profits from their oil industry 
is dispersed as an individual uh, social dividend each year uh, to all residents who've satisfied the six month uh, residency uh, criterion in order to receive that payment in Alaska. And that's been going since the 1980s. UBI, so that is more in line with the definition above from Dan. This is everyone, everybody formally getting the same uh, regular payment uh, with no uh, conditionality attached. And then the, the NIT, the negative income tax, where, uh, you know, as market incomes rise, the level of the basic income that you receive uh, will fall. Okay, basic income history, I could talk about this for ages, uh, but I certainly won't today. Uh, I divide it up into sort of four moments. So the 19th century moment going back to Tom Paine, who's sometimes seen as the originator of uh, this idea of basic income, not, not universally, but by many. Uh, the largely forgotten Belgian liberal socialists and these US Jacksonian Democrats. And I would characterize this group as, as really being focused with uh, taxing land, landed property, uh, inheritance, in order to compensate people from uh, the, fact, uh, the fact that most people did not have equal access uh, to land and they were denied uh, equal access to nature's patrimony. Really like the ideas of Henry George, but uh, 50 to 100 years before George. Then uh, really there's a, a gap in the basic income literature and then it re-emerges as a key concern in the UK between the 1920s up to the 1950s, associated with various figures, uh, Quaker Party, uh, sorry, Quakers, Labor Party activists, people like Nobel Prize winning economists, such as James Mead, and Liberal Party uh, activist, um, Juliet Rees Williams. Uh, again, this is considered at the highest level, ultimately rejected by um, most political parties. Uh, well, really all political parties in the end. It was even you know, put to Churchill in the early 1950s, but ultimately rejected in favour of the beverage model of uh, the welfare state, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Then we have this third moment, which is associated with uh, North America, both in terms of Nixon's family assistance program uh, which was going to uh, introduce uh, a sort of negative income tax scheme, which would have had a, a dramatic uh, effect on reducing poverty in the American South, but not necessarily such a major impact in the North of the United States. It passed the US House of Representatives twice and then was rejected in the Senate Finance Committee by an alliance of left-wing Democrats and right-wing Republicans. But probably more interestingly, during this period, there were a whole lot of trials of uh, different types of basic income schemes. Again, really the negative income tax schemes, four in the US, one in Canada and the Manitoba Mincom uh, in the city of Dauphin uh, in Canada is probably the most interesting example because it was a, a saturation site. And uh, a scholar, David Kalnitsky, has done some really interesting work looking at how uh, making this program available, open to anyone to participate in, had a significant effect in terms of destigmatizing receipt of uh, this form of this new form of welfare. It was pitched as an experiment rather than as the traditional stigmatized conditional welfare. Then jumping ahead, we have the Swiss referendum in 2016. Uh, which was heavily defeated. So only 23% of the Swiss population voted uh, for introducing UBI with a higher percentage of young people, about 35% of young people supported it. Uh, we had trials in Finland, Ontario, uh, Andrew Yang's presidential campaign, uh, which uh, are all flawed in different ways. And unfortunately within the time constraints, I don't have time to um, explain all the different ways in which they were flawed. And then two little interesting examples of quasi-basic incomes that are actually in existence today are the Gyeonggi province 
youth basic income in South Korea and Maracas, which is a satellite city of Rio de Janeiro and Brazil's citizens basic income program. And there's some details, details there in the slide. And they're quite innovative programs that are actually, we can differentiate them from the trials because they're actually uh, permanent ongoing policy programs rather than these uh, attempts to have, you know, randomized, uh, controlled, large scale social trials that provide the evidence on which to, uh, you know, judge the effects of a basic income. Okay, quick pros and cons. Uh, the arguments for basic income, reducing poverty, inequality, income insecurity, enhancing freedom, a partial compensation for unpaid work disproportionately done by women, uh, enhancing workers, workers' bargaining power potentially, reducing unnecessary bureaucracy in people's lives, and potentially reducing the stigmatize, stigmatization attached to conditional welfare. Uh, cons, criticisms, fiscal costs, too expensive. Uh, labor market disincentives created by having an automatic right to income and potential inflationary effects. Okay, now jumping to the present moment uh, of COVID-19. Uh, and I'm framing this as, you know, is this crisis an opportunity for progressing the basic income debate, whether it's in Australia or in other countries? It's an open question. I don't know the answer to it. But obviously we see that we saw this radical fiscal intervention by a centre-right coalition government, uh, you know, moving into hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, massively increasing public debt, which had previously been uh, you know, the, that side of politics had railed against as being fiscally reckless and all that kind of stuff. That went out the window in the crisis. And as you'd all be aware, we had the introduction of the JobKeeper rate, wage subsidy program and then the JobSeeker uh, unemployment benefit that doubled the previous new start rate. And uh, Phillips, Graham, Biddle uh, have a good paper that sort of does some scenario modelling uh, based around these changes and, you know, found that the effect of the increase in the job uh, seeker payment dramatically reduced uh, income poverty rates uh, among that cohort of unemployed, un, uh, uh, those in receipt of unemployment assistance from 67% down to 7%. Um, Okay, and there are links, by the way, in this in the slides, which I will share, um, or there are links to all of these papers. Then this is a, a another study that's being released today. Actually, there's there's a an event on right now uh, with my my friend Elise Klein as one of the co-authors of Social Security and Time Use During COVID nineteen, which presents some sort of qualitative uh, research into the experience of um, 80 odd people who who move from the lower to the the much higher uh, rate of job seeker and they look at a whole range of you know the traditional uh, quality of life indicators and what people did uh, with this additional uh, income uh, using uh, time use surveys right and seeing some pretty some decent results in terms of uh, mental health physical health and other factors. Okay, public attitudes to basic income. This is a, another interesting area and there's increasingly a, a, a greater literature uh, on this and, and you know, longitudinal surveys such as the European Social Survey are including questions on basic income, uh, you know, each time. Um, and, and we see some very different results. Sometimes you can say we see some very high levels of support for a basic income, but I'm just putting this slide up to show that, uh, you know, the questions are framed in radically different ways. And uh, a pretty obvious factor is once you introduce uh, the question of how much taxation might need to be increased in order to finance basic income, uh, then you can see those support levels uh, dropping off quite substantially. Still, there, there's, um, there, there is some encouragement for those interested or you know, advocating basic income 
in some of this uh, survey data. Uh, and recently, until very recently, we had no evidence at all about Australian attitudes to basic income. And then Tim, Tim Hollow from the Greens Institute um, commissioned YouGov to survey Australian attitudes and found that 58% of respondents would support a guaranteed living wage or universal basic income with 19% opposed and 50% agreed with the statement we should provide unconditional income support to those of out of work compared to 25% opposed. And in some unpublished work, um, Roger Petulny and, and Ben Spees Butcher have, they also managed to introduce uh, identical questions to those used in use in the European social attitudes, European social survey uh, in OSA. Um, and there will be a paper coming out on those findings uh, later in the year. But they found that pre COVID, there was sort of 43 to 45% support for UBI. And that actually uh, increased uh, appreciably for part of the survey that was conducted after COVID got going. And, you know, perhaps that's unsurprising given people's experience of this sudden shock and uh, a much larger cohort of people being in receipt of, of the job keeper or job seeker payments. Okay, two um, proposals that have been put forward uh, that are quite different uh, as potential options for moving Australia towards some type of basic income scheme. Uh, the Livable Income Guarantee, which is sort of mainly driven by John Quiggan, but also Elise Klein, Tim Don Dunlop, myself and, and Jane Goodall, really looking to prioritise the basic uh, part of universal basic income, right? So uh, trying to move payment rates towards the level of the age pension, either the single or the, the couple rate. And attaching a sort of mild uh, conditionality to it in the form of a participation activity. And you can see the, the various types of activities that were included, included under that um, banner, which uh, participation income is also a fairly old idea that some of you may be familiar with. Tony Atkinson, the late Tony Atkinson was a, a great uh, advocate of this and saw it as a means of trying to overcome some of that uh, hostility that people might automatically feel to this uh, money for nothing argument. The, the counter argument to the participation income is that it creates unnecessary bureaucracy and in a way, as Andre Gort said, makes uh, voluntary work uh, compulsory. But it could still be seen as a concession worth making in order to deliver the income security, poverty reduction and income inequality outcomes that would be associated with this type of basic income. Again, there's a briefing paper uh, published that, that's linked in the slides and available on the um, tax and transfer policy website at ANU. And a, an estimated cost, uh, pre-pandemic cost estimate, obviously when unemployment was, was much lower, uh, John Quiggan estimated at around $20 billion or 1% of GDP, which to be honest is a, a pretty modest fiscal cost. Uh, the other option comes from a paper that uh, was co-authored by Ben Spees Butcher, Ben Phillips, uh, Ben Spees Butcher from Macquarie University, Ben Phillips from ANU and myself and the, the full paper is still open access at um, Economic and Labor Relations Review with the, the link there. And we, uh, we looked at this model of an affluence tested uh, Australian basic income where income testing is primarily used to limit access by the better off rather than targeting payments only to the poor. So you'd still get uh, significant uh, partial payments of the basic income uh, quite some way up the income distribution, uh, but not the full amount. And we, are, we suggested that this approach would move Australia in the Australian social transfer system in a more universal direction while containing uh, the fiscal cost and associated 
uh, fiscal churn. Okay, sorry. Principles, uh, we'll not spend too long on this, uh, just that we did articulate sort of four uh, design principles for this model of basic income. And uh, we use two rates. And this is in the pre-COVID-19 context. So we're using the old new start rate, which we all know is um, radically inadequate and hasn't increased in real terms until very recently, but um, in, in before that going back to the early 1990s. And then we had a sort of new start plus $75 per week, which at the time was based on the raise the rate campaign. And we modeled those two different scenarios, well, Ben Phillips did, using ANU's uh, policy mod micro simulation tool and came up with an estimated uh, net annual fiscal cost of about 104 billion for model one and 126 billion for model two, which are obviously considerable sums, but if, and, and this is a static micro simulation, uh, it would increase Australia's tax to GDP ratio from the current relatively low uh, taxation ratio up to around the OECD average. Um, and we, did, we did our modelling of the static distributional effects in a very kind of blunt way, just increasing uh, personal or marginal income tax rates by 12 percentage points for Model 1 and 14.5 percentage points for Model 2. And we just we used did that for illustrative purposes and wouldn't be advocating that that's the that's the optimal way to finance a basic income scheme. But even using this sort of blunt um, measure, sorry, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Uh, it showed some positive effects in terms of inequality being reduced by fifty to sixty five Gini points, income inequality and poverty rates falling by between seventeen and 22%. So this would see Australian income inequality fall from uh, its current rate to around Scandinavian levels, but with a tax to GDP ratio more uh, around the level of Germany. And some of that information is given in these, is reiterated in these summary tables, uh, which you can look through at your leisure. Okay, and this just gets back to the, the finance, the point I was making about financing, that it would be silly in a way to rely purely on increasing uh, personal income tax rates to finance, uh, of, say, a $126 billion uh, basic income scheme, and that we could look to a combination of different sources of revenue uh, from reducing tax expenditures to uh, using some deficit financing and other forms of direct and indirect taxation. Okay, I'm going to move through this slide. Um, and okay, this slide basic, basically gives a summary of design and implement, implementation uh, options uh, for a basic income scheme. And I've basically come around to the idea that phased implementation uh, by age cohort might be the optimal way of trying to implement such a scheme in practice. And if we think about a scheme that might cost, you know, let's say $130 billion a year in Australia, Australia we can deal with this sort of fiscal impact in bite-sized chunks of maybe $15 billion a year, which is a relatively small uh, share of GDP. Um, depending on each cohort's labour force participation. Um, because obviously it is, it's fundamentally different to uh, consider uh, a trial or a scheme that might cost $200 million compared to a $100 billion plus basic income scheme that, it, that we all know is not just going to be introduced in, in one or two uh, federal government budgets. Okay. Um, politics. Yeah, I'll just make a quick point on this, that uh, an issue with all of the trials that have been conducted with basic income is often it includes 500 people, 2,000 people, 3,000 people. And that's not really any kind of significant political cohort. And a whole problem with the, the history of basic income in, in terms of moving from an idea to practical implementation is it's very much been an elite-led sort of policy 
uh, elite or policy entrepreneur led uh, process rather than having any uh, social movement uh, supporting a, a push for basic income. And so one argument in favour of this phased implementation from a political perspective could be that you immediately create quite a large um, cohort with some uh, vested interest in maintaining and extending the scheme. And this is just completely not the case with a five, 10 or even 15 year trial such as is being conducted in Kenya at the moment. Uh, from a research perspective, um, so researchers and move from being focused on analyzing small scale trials and pilots and experiments to using the phased implementation process itself as a site for a whole range of longitudinal and cross-sectional uh, studies that analyze the effects of BAA, basic income across a range of disciplines and wide variety of variables. Okay, um, I'm just gonna say on that note, thanks a lot. I think I've always, I've almost kept to time. Um, please feel free to keep in touch with me and I will share these slides in the chat now. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Troy. And um, most of you are muted. So if anyone wishes to, um, anyone wishes to um, ask questions, please do so. But first of all, unmute. Yes, I'd like to ask a question if I can. Um, one of the arguments against this UBI is um, that it counteracts the effect of redistribution, that the idea of government is to act, or socially, social government is to counteract the natural tendency to capital uh, accumulation and income the uh, inequality isn't that isn't that true thanks for the question I, I think it really depends on how the basic income scheme is designed right so if the scheme is financed using progressive taxation and the net result is a shift in the income distribution towards the lower couple of income quintiles, then it can have a positive effect in terms of income distribution. And that's even, even with our modeling for the Australian basic income model that I discussed with Ben Phillips and Ben Spees Butcher, it, it showed a you know, sig significant decline in static income in inequality. But what about if you simply made it, say, below the um, um, sort of a minimum wage or a livable wage, it was guaranteed below that, that you would never go below that income. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be um, sort of more, more efficient? Instead yeah, in, in a way. Like, yeah, sorry. No, so, sorry, you go on. No, I mean, instead of first giving and then taking it away, tax again, just don't give it. To, right? Sure, and, and that's why we, in, that, in those models, we have come down on that side of the argument, right? So there is a basic minimum that everyone can rely on. Okay, and our scheme, it wasn't even particularly generous. It was $350 a week, but individualized, right, for that second model, not, um, and with no mutual obligation or anything like that attached to it. So even with that not particularly generous level of payment, which we'd still say is below, you know, the Henderson poverty line, it had a positive impact in the model, in the micro simulations on both poverty and inequality, right? And it's partly to do with the somewhat higher base rate compared to the, um, the status quo at the time but also to do with the fact that you're, you only lose, you lose the payment through a gradual taper as market incomes increase, right? So it's not the idea, a lot of people have the idea of basic income and some people fiercely defend this because it can have the same distributional outcomes as uh, more of a negative income tax scheme that 
okay, we'll say the basic income is $25,000 a year and everyone's going to get that. <laughs> but of course, as you say, it introduces an inefficiency of, of paying people all this money and taxing it straight back off them, uh, plus maybe additional taxation to finance the scheme. No, so yeah. so that, that is an argument for more of the guaranteed minimum income or negative income tax approach. But it also puts, um, the, shall we say, I mean, there's a lot of um, income tax evasion by suitable means uh, by just increasing the progressive income tax to pay for it you're essentially also making it more, um, shall we say, uh, more of an incentive to uh, try and avoid income tax. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point. And I think that, you know, part of my response to that would be, you know, not relying just on progressive income taxation to finance the entire scheme. You know, like a combination of, uh, wealth taxation, even potentially using some consumption taxation, which are regressive uh, forms of taxation, but using it for a progressive redistributive function, uh, using that along with say carbon taxes and winding back tax concessions, which we know tax concessions in terms of revenue foregone in Australia, uh, you know, cost the budget an enormous amount. So using that combination of different revenue sources uh, to finance a basic income scheme, in my view, would be far preferable to you know, simply relying on, on uh, as, as you said, personal income taxes. Okay, thank you. No worries. Yes, I'm, uh, and so I'm just trying at this time to share my slides while I answer the question, but this is not being very effective. So I might just have to send them to Roger and ask them to be distributed yeah. yeah what i might do um troy is i'll just pdf them because at the moment they're about 10 megabytes i can get them down to a couple of hundred k's and oh uh, great thanks i'll send you the i've got a slightly updated version from the one you have so i'll send it after the meeting thanks sorry simon uh well as a bit of an outsider can you explain something to me because this is the bit i want to know is more is the key to all this you you seem to have come up with a solution to a problem but what is the problem in Australia that is forcing people to talk about a universal basic income? Okay, I, I'd start by saying probably not many people are talking about universal basic income, okay. even though it, it's, it's becoming a bit more prominent and you do have a situation where at least the, the Australian Greens, the third biggest political party, that's part of their policy platform to introduce a basic income. So it's a higher level of debate than has been the case in the past. Um, the second question, it's the normal issues. Okay, so Australia has a problem with insecure work. So one of the highest rates of non-standard employment in the OECD, with depending on which paper you're reading on what day, you know, between 20 and 25% of employees in casual employment with no you know, access to paid, paid leave, or paid holidays, all that kind of stuff that kind of like the zero hours contract debate in, in the UK. Um, then there is an increase in wealth and income inequality over the last 30 years, um, not to the extent of say the US, but th that being an issue, uh, the ongoing uh, issue of poverty uh so you know th those are the the main types of issues that it would address and i think I, I would add to that that it is um trying to push against all the dictates of workfare right so the increasing increasingly punitive system of sort of surveillance monitoring mutual obligation uh, requirements for uh those in receipt of unemployment assistance yeah so the a big part of the basic income debate is you know this un the, the unconditional element of it that stops wasting people's time in sort of pointless programs that don't actually get them a job so involved in that i mean 
and this idea of conditionality that's, that exists um, and the universal basic income goes against that, which is a good thing in my eyes. But um, is, is the present system in Australia uh, discriminatory? Does it affect the young? Does it affect, well, the working class obviously would affect them more. But what about the First Nations youth, for instance? Are they affected more? Oh, uh, by uh, this uh, or absolutely. So I can see some other people nodding who are probably far more knowledgeable than myself. But we have uh, the, the sort of punitive conditions that uh, Indigenous people face in some jurisdictions in uh, Australia with income quarantining and this thing called the basics card part of um, the Northern Territory intervention that's then become, uh, th that's been spread to other parts of Australia. So yeah, there's an added le level of um, discrimination. I think probably most people would agree in relation to uh, that uh, group of, in, in relation to Indigenous Australians. And, and yes, young people, you know, the, the youth allowance payment is a, an even more meagre payment than uh, unemployment benefit. And youth unemployment, as in most countries, is substantially higher, unemployment and underemployment substantially higher than uh, for the rest of the population. And, and particularly high in some, you know, regional and rural areas. I think that's another thing to consider about basic income that it could be really important in areas where work is less abundant, more seasonal, uh, you know, less reliable, that it keeps, it traps some income in those communities that's able to be pumped into keeping those local towns alive. Thank you. No worries. Um, Troy, there's a question um, in the chat room okay. from Michaela. Now, uh, I'm not sure if Michaela would like to ask that question. Give you a little bit of time to. I can. I wondered if. A... Sorry, Michaela, did you? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, if I'm muted, sorry, I, I don't have my sort of camera operational. Uh, so I should have actually just mentioned that. Um, uh, my contribution to the chat is more of a comment than a question. Um, but, um, but just to sort of uh, recap what I said, I, I think in the context of JobKeeper and the problematics that it raises, it had seemed clear to me that a, a UBI might actually be uh, sort of more cost, cost effective, you know, during a downturn and would certainly be sort of more efficient from an economics or welfare sense compared to uh, JobKeeper. So, I, I, you know, I've wondered about uh, whether a cyclically activated UBI might be an effective way to go in terms of a transition to something more full blown. Uh, that said, I actually think that um, your suggestion of introducing UBIs gradually through various demographic cohorts might actually work better than that. Um, I, I sort of note uh, some interesting recent contributions advocating a so-called child allowance in the United States, which is effectively a UBI for kids. Um, and I think that would be a really um, sensible idea and very consistent with A.B. Atkinson's sort of ideas about pre-distribution, basically giving everyone a basically fighting chance at the start of life through the first 20 years of life, building up, um, you know, good sort of capital seed funds um, in order to access good opportunities in life. So. Um, so it's just more of a comment, sorry. Well, I, I think it's a great comment and I, I agree with all of those things and also have included some, some consideration of uh, ba using basic income as a counter cyclical macroeconomic policy tool as uh, part of the way that it could be useful. Right? I still think it's important to have the, the basic unconditional payment and then you could, for example, and some people might object to this for being technocratic, but for example, if the Reserve Bank or some other agency could vary the level of UBI by 10, 20% based on where you were in a macroeconomic cycle, then yes, you could add stimulus to the economy 
quite easily. You'd have an automatic channel to um, obviously boost people's incomes, which is fundamentally important in itself, but that's going to be a positive overall macroeconomic stimulus. And then in the case that you did have runaway inflation, which is, you know, we haven't seen anything approaching deflation for uh, inflation for decades. Um, you could think about taking some of the uh, stimulus out of, of the heat out of the economy by reducing the level of the, of the UBI. And James, I should just add, uh, James Mead, that uh, Nobel Prize winning economist who I mentioned, did think of basic income in those terms. Um, Christian? Christian. Thank you very much for the talk. It was informative. Um, I really like the idea of it being unconditional and not having a means testing just because less rules means it's less gameable, which is good. Um, I'm thinking about what happens when people's income is managed by an institution that they're in. So, for example, in Perth, Western Australia, if you're in an old person's home, they'll take about 90% of your superannuation. So rather than that going to you, that will go to them. Uh, as a matter of them caring for you, so they act as a middleman. And also, I'm not sure how it works in um, prisons uh, across Australia, but I, I expect that if there were money coming in, then they'll probably act as a middleman as well. So with cash payments, would this just be cash payments going straight to somebody's bank account, or would it be possible for institutions that are housing people to get their hands on it? How do you imagine? That? It's a really interesting question. One I've never had and uh, not spent much time or not spent any time considering. I'd say that, yes, it should, it should be directly paid. You can imagine in Australia that there was your, like your, let's call it your basic income account or your fair go income account or whatever you want to call it. And it's in your MyGov, attached to your MyGov account and the money goes in there. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, calculated by the ATO what it should be over a period of time. And I think that, you know, people in jail might be a big social debate, but, you know, the money should just flow in there. And that's probably going to help people when they get out of um, prison in terms of making that transition by actually having some um, financial resources to rely on. I'm very, I'm completely unfamiliar with the, uh, the management in aged care homes, you were saying, of, of people's superannuation. Um, so I'm just going to think about that and I don't have an automatic response uh, to it. Okay, thanks, Troy. Cheers, mate. Okay, Troy, uh, we have Marty now who would like to ask a question. Sure. Okay. I think Ma Marty's muted. You might have to unmute. Um, there we go. Yeah, the it's the current pandemic curse, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, question in relation to with UBI and UBS, uh, Universal Basic Services, and it was prompted by thoughts of um, Indigenous communities, especially remote, which is my area of study and area of interest. However, it does also con connect me or make me think of um, areas that are affected by intense poverty. Um, so when we're calculating UBI, do we factor in a basic service level and the reason I ask this is for example in the communities that I'm involved with a lot of the money that is acquired through government or through work or through humbug is normally distributed to the energy company for example or the or other health company basically health resources and services so do we factor UBI with UBS? Uh, thanks for that question and it's been interesting to see the sort of UBS debate um, gather steam in, in ways, in a way as a response to the increasing prominence of debates around UBI. I like, I have no problem with all of the, the ideas of universal basic services. To me, it just sounds like social democracy, right? That, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a rebadging of uh, social democracy or left social democracy, yeah. if you like. Um, and a key criticism by many people, and I've said you know, progressives on the left, is that uh, a UBI is going to be a, a sort of a backdoor to abolishing the welfare state, right? So uh, definitely from my perspective, I fundamentally disagree with the idea that it's an either or 
you know, contention. Like nothing was changed in, in, for example, our modeling of that basic income scheme. There was no change to any, you know, payments that were being directed to health, education, uh, all the rest of it. I should also add that with our model, anyone on a higher payment, so, you know, age pension or disability pension stayed on that payment, right? It was just about boosting, moving the unemployment benefit towards the higher level and hopefully universalizing that and individualizing it over time. I also think basic income would work much better because there's this argument about, oh, it's going to be inflationary. You're giving more people money and it's going to be inflationary. And the areas where I think that could be an issue, particularly in the Australian debate, childcare and housing, right? So, I mean, those are big issues anyway. So universal childcare and greater access to affordable housing, social housing, they would make the real value of the basic income um, higher. Yeah. Thank you. I see. Oh, Mark Smith. Yes, Mark. All right. Um, thanks for that presentation. I wanted to ask a question about the relationship between income support and minimum wage, in particular to the 10% of working population that are temporary visa holders. Um, it just seems that this, I mean, there are, there's obvious structural inequality in our system at the moment. Um, for these workers. And I just get the impression that UBI is just going to validate that and not only validate it, reinforce it. So I'm, I'm wondering how you, how you feel about the UBI being more than for permanent residents and visa holders. Yeah, that's a, that's a massive debate and, and a, a global debate about who should actually uh, get access to this payment and whether it's, you know, like they do in Alaska with the permanent div fund dividend, which is obviously, it's a much smaller amount, you know, it's like two or 3,000 US a year, but it goes to everyone, including children. Um, whether you just need to satisfy maybe a residency requirement of a like six, 12 months rather than being a permanent resident, which we know can take a million years that could be one way or you could make the unabashed case for saying you know everyone who's working in australia paying taxes you know everyone who's living in australia sorry should be able to access the basic income and we can see that there'll be there'll be obvious political pushback to something like this scheme anyway and that would magnify that would probably intensify exactly, yeah. the the degree of political opposition to it um but ethically, people might still make the decision that uh, you know we need to uh, pro we, we need to include all of those all of those people who who are living in the country. Um, I don't I don't feel it's an easy uh, question to answer, but it's a really good question. Thanks, Mark. We have uh, Michaela would like to just follow up. Uh, yes. So uh, th thanks, Roger. I, uh... It's a double double dip contribution uh, to the chat, if I might. Um, a question this time. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, Troy, whether you have a view with regard to the potential effects of universal basic income, similar schemes upon entrepreneurship and uh, innovation. It would seem, at least from a macro uh, macroeconomic perspective, that uh, these phenomena might well actually have some deflationary. Uh, sort of effects attached uh, to UBI, but I'm uh, interested in your view. Would would the effect on entrepreneurship and innovation be big, small? Uh, what do you think? Well, I think the most direct answer to say, in, in the honest answer is to say, I don't know, <laughs> right? But but it is certainly a key reason why a lot of, you know, not just the tech the, the Silicon Valley tech billionaires like uh, Mark Zuckerberg and and uh, Elon Musk who support basic income in some form, but it does appeal to a certain group of young tech people, I suppose <laughs> I could say, like I've given, I've been part of plenty of conversations and talks and panels with that group of people who do see it as providing the um, security 
to be able to take risks. And you know, from a, so, a sociologist, you know, risks come in all these different forms and, and part of basic income's um, theoretical appeal at least is that it um, ameliorates a whole lot of different types of risk across the life course. It could encourage some groups of people to take uh, risks in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation because they know they'd have something at least to fall back on. Um, there's no great empirical evidence to substantiate that as yet. And I don't think you'd get that until you have a, a national level um, program that is permanent because that's obviously a problem with so many of these trials, not just that they're small and sometimes completely unrepresentative such as the Finnish trial, which was just 2,000 long-term unemployed people, um, but they are time limited. So that's going to affect how people's, uh, it, that's going to affect the sort of incentive structure for, for people in relation to the receipt of this income, because they know in two years, I won't have it anymore. Thanks for that. Now, Mark, you, um in, in inverted commas, put libertarian. Would you like to follow up on that or? No, I mean, that's the thing is that UBI just is attractive to libertarians, whether they're left or right wing. And I mean, I think that's that's the thing. I mean, that's one reason I made this question about, you know, uh, non-visa holders is like in this whole libertarian argument of equality is like here we have a huge cohort of people who this actually will reinforce inequality. Yeah, and look, that is a common criticism and you can cite some evidence in support of it, right? And partly it is to do with that the libertarians tend to be quite loud in the basic income debate. What is interesting increasingly is the, the, the survey of research that um, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy. There's a good uh, recent paper, sorry, I completely forgot the name of the guy, but on um, social attitudes analyzing the um, European social att attitudes uh, data and showing that it tends to actually be more of your left leaning or progressive or somewhat social democratic uh, cohorts of people who are more supportive of basic income, which does, you know, call that idea into question that basic income is, you know, automatically a libertarian perspective and because Musk and Zuckerberg and a few others support it, ergo we should reject it if we're interested in equality and poverty reduction and those types of things would have helped if i could remember the name of the paper sorry um troy i'm sure that you'll remember immediately after the seminar so um I'm can, facebook friends with a guy <laughs> could go and search it we can include that in the uh, in the youtube um clip later on if you like sure are there any other questions? Um, I think, oh, Christian. Um, oh, um, that wasn't really a question. It's just- Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, for my doctorate, I was using Guy Standing's work with UBI. And uh, oftentimes when I spoke to people, particularly people my age, they were just saying, well, the money they put into crypto is money that they wouldn't miss. So more money they wouldn't miss would be more money for crypto, which probably isn't a big deal now, but we'll see how that goes in like five or 10 years with, uh, this market that more and more young people are getting involved in but become more acquainted with investing perhaps absolutely yeah i mean i can and there are quite a few of the crypto libertarians are attracted to basic income in different ways and but a lot of them start as also somewhat idealistic you know bitcoin has just become this sort of hoarding you know digital gold speculative asset and of course if you did buy it when it was you're a tech nerd and you bought it when it was $50 and now it's like 40,000 US. Well, even if Bitcoin is totally useless, it would possibly be the best financial decision you ever made in your life. Um, whereas so many of those other cryptocurrencies have already gone, uh, you know, to zero. And who knows if that'll be the case uh, for Bitcoin one day. But I do think that the use of sort of innovative use of digital currency, and I know it's not identical to... Um, cryptocurrencies is 
it's a, it's a part of this debate. So that, that for example, that youth based income in South Korea and the citizens income in America, in Brazil, are part, part paid with these local digital currencies, which can be spent in the local area. So they're kind of tied to sort of local community stimulus, as well as providing a redistributive mechanism using a, a digital currency. Okay, thanks, Christian. Uh, Marty has made a comment, and uh, I'm not sure if you want to comment on that, uh, if you want to add to it, Marty, or you'd just like to, like to leave it there. Well, where does, where does speculation end and investment begin, or the other way around? Yeah, that was my point, is that, yeah, typically investing is investing in means of production, whereas crypto doesn't. It's actually, for me, it's a form of gambling. Yeah. And speculation, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just ask, uh, uh, well, everybody the same question, uh, not just to, to Troy. Um, what's wrong with increasing taxes? Make the, the wealthy pay more. Or is that something shouldn't be said in Australia? Oh, well, you can try, and then particularly if you try and increase taxes on mining companies, then you find that you quickly lose oh, yeah. your job and you're, you're, kicked out of, you're kicked out of office. But yes, it is, it's not possible to have a basic income scheme on an ongoing basis without increasing taxes. Um, I'm not going to get into a modern monetary theory debate here because, you know, that'll go down another... Uh, rabbit hole. And that doesn't mean you can't use some level of deficit financing as part of it to get the scheme off the ground. That's what our government just did, going into a massive deficit to fund finance, uh, job keeper and job seeker, which is the right thing to do. But yeah, well, I, I think probably most, most of us might agree that there's nothing ethically wrong with raising taxes, but politically, it's, it's damn hard, even, even at the even at the margins, even these like little tinkerings with tax, tax concessions elicits a, a very strong negative response from the beneficiaries of those concessions. Well, I mean, in the UK, I mean, the, the big argument is why are major transnational companies allowed to get away with tax evasion? Surely we should be able to clamp on them. They're making money out of... Uh, various nations, those nations should be able to tax them fully. And they seem to get away with it. Yep, and we, we have a similar debate to a degree here, probably focused on different industries in Australia. Um, my point probably in relation to basic income is I think that the scheme is big enough that you need to look at a variety of different revenue sources to um, finance the scheme for both, mainly for political reasons, right? But you could say for a combination of economic and political reasons. Um, Mark had his hand up, so I'll just, and after that, I think we better cut that off, uh, cut off the discussion, okay, Mark? Um, yeah, you, I mean, you said in your, in your recent paper that you basically brute forced the whole um, financing of this through the income tax system, but the, have, are you going to, or have you looked at other forms of um, work within the system? I mean, a classic example would be the Labor Party policy that they just trashed after the election about um, uh, franking credits. Um, we have a very highly targeted social security system and a very loose um, taxation system. There seems to be a lot of way, I mean, Taxing food might be controversial, particularly as that would um, basically reinforce inequality. But I mean, there are, there seems to be there's a lot of um, there's a lot of slack within our um, taxation system that isn't income tax related. Um, are you going to look at that, or are you consider? I mean, I know this is you're more of a preaching preaching to convert people to the idea first rather than the practicality of it. But yeah. Oh, no, I'm very much in, interested in the practicality of it and, and looking at those different 
uh, financing options, including, I mean, and you're probably aware of it, there's been a lot of work looking at the, the cost of, say, superannuation tax concessions or concessional treatment of You can dump, uh, you can dump tax capital gains altogether. All, all of those are possibility. But you know what? Like superannuation is the most popular government policy. Whatever we might think about it, it's more popular than Medicare, right? You know, Med- Medicare is number two. So, um, yes, in terms of equity and efficiency, getting rid of all the super tax concessions and the franking credit stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, uh, the concessional treatment of capital gains tax for housing, um, negative gearing, all of that, all yeah. of that would cover a decent basic income scheme. Um, try to do that politically. <laughs> You've got a, a and, and obviously I'm saying that that's a good way to go, but uh, politically, so, socially, culturally, it's a like enormous challenge. Okay, thank you everyone. I think we better um, be a little bit time bound, unfortunately, and I'll close it off with that. So I'd like to thank Troy once again Thanks very much for a very informative discussion. And this will be available in about 24 hours on YouTube.